The Polish Quake player Avek is an utterly unique player. I don't think we'll ever, we've never, we never saw a player with his exact skill set and style and mental approach. And I don't know that we'll ever see one again in, in a dual FPS game like Quake. He appeared as a young prodigy, much like you think of people like, obviously you have Cypher, Cooler, these guys just came up out of nowhere. Rafa was kind of a similar age. He came up when he was like 15 years old. And this is a guy where for at least four years, he was really in a position where he, he was beating the best players in the world. He was making deep runs in tournaments. He could he was in contention to become the best player in the world. But he never quite did it, actually. That's what's interesting about Avex's career. He, in terms of longevity, it's amazing how long he was a contender. And yet he never actually was like the clear-cut best in the world. There was always some other god of Quake at the time who, yes, he could beat them in a tournament. He could outplace them in a tournament, but they were just ahead in terms of the consistency, in terms of the ranking. And yet, the thing about Avec was, it didn't matter whether he actually did win and become the best in the world. His style was so compelling to watch. It was so exciting. It just elicited all the emotions and excitement that kind of aroused within you a fire when you watched him play. And it just, it was beyond just someone just playing a game and just having fun or just playing and saying, oh, I want to win and winning's what it's all about or just trying to score points and stay ahead. This was like fury. This was just fire. This was... This was balls the way this guy played and his skills. He would just bring them. And he was, you know, that, you know, that famous phrase that says like iron sharpens iron. That's what Avec, Avec's play was like. If you played against Avec and you were a great player, playing Avec would make you a better player. And if you weren't a better player, this guy might bully the fuck out of you and just knock you out the tournament. No matter where your placing was, if you were, you might have been on three tournaments in a row winning streak. This guy could beat you. Even when he was 15 years old, 16 years old, even if you were a tenured champion who had the strategy and the skills, whatever it was in all these areas, it never would matter in a match against Avec. If his game was right, if his mind was right, and you were on the wrong sort of a day, or you just played very well, but he played a little bit better, he could get the better of you, anyone. And that's what was amazing about him as a player. So I'll kind of run through a bit of his history so people have a sense of who this guy was and the context of his era. So in 2006, that's when he really arose, arrived rather, I should probably say, and this was in Quake 4. Now in Quake 4, he appears around the era when Toxic, the famous Swedish dueler who had amazing aim and a really sort of... When I say grinding, we usually think of grinding players as being players who are quite boring and their skills aren't that great and they just figure out like the way to win. Like They make the game ugly and they just win scoring the easy points and make it difficult for the opponent. No, he, he was grinding in the sense that he was just a brick wall of aim and then he would play a very rote style. It reminded me of the old school fatality when he was winning in the early days. Just really good aim that was always consistently to a certain level. So skills are always at a certain output of performance level. And then his style is just very like textbook. Like he's figured out how to do this and I just do it a million times over. I'm going to win 9 out of 10 situations, 10 out of 10 at times because he's very, very dominant in Quake 4. So when he was super dominant, this is when Avec appears. And Toxic's winning everything. No one can really unseat Toxic. But Avec appears. And people are winning maps of Toxic. People are coming close to winning a series, but they never are. And Avic appears and he, he starts to become a contender level person. He's in that sort of second, third, fourth grouping of people that was like him, Sturmy, Cooler. These were the guys around there. Fatality would come up the next year. Yeah, those, those are sort of the players, many. Cypher eventually would appear. He comes up, he appears around there. 2006, he has a couple of top fours, pretty decent. 2007 is where he suddenly like breaks out. Like now he's beating like Sturmy. I remember there was some like baller tournament. It was on the I series, like I30 maybe in England, where in this tournament, there's this crazy story. Avec told me this anecdote where he didn't even practice one of the maps. I forget which map it was in Quake Fox. I remember, I forget some of the map names in that game. He didn't even practice one of the maps. It wasn't a map he gave a fuck about. So in this series, Avec was coming from the lower bracket. In this series, every single time he would like, Okay, that map would be Sturmy's map. Matt Sturmy would win that. And then Avec just beat him on the other two maps. At the time, Sturmy was a really consistent player. He was a really solid number two, number three in the world. Avec just beats him two, two best of threes in a row, despite both times losing that particular map. And that map being one that he just doesn't give a fuck about. That just kind of tells you, like, the kind of persona he had. That didn't phase him. He never thought, well, I've got one map out of it. You know, he's already one map towards victory. He was like, okay, I'll beat him on the other two. Who gives a fuck? Play your map. Win it. I don't care. Just this sort of sheer, it was almost the arrogance to dare to believe you could be the best and to actually go in there and just do it and not, not afterwards say, oh, well, my plan was this and oh, the excuse, I didn't know that. Man. Just to go in there and fucking beat this guy who's one of the best in the world because you've got the skills and you just you just manifest them in that way. There's something pure about that. He was able to sort of just be in the moment and just act in a pure way of just the expression of what he thinks and the way he feels like the game should be played in that instant. 
And what his intuition, his gut just tells him to do, he just obeys that. That's, he just follows his true will in that moment. And that's actually like almost a magical concept if you've ever looked into any kind of esoteric aspect. It's the idea that you want to get all the conscious mind out of the way. You want to get overthinking, overanalysis, all these things that are great outside of the game, especially reflectively, introspectively looking back. But in the moment, you want to just have it so that if you have it within you to be a champion, you have the skills, you have the understanding of how to play the game, you want to get out of your way. You want to just let that aspect come forward and manifest in the world and have an effect on the world. And if you can have that tangible effect in that sense, you can be great. You can be one of the greatest to ever compete in any sport, any game. So 2007 is when Avic really gets cooking. And then he goes to, it was in Louisiana, I think. No, let me think. Louisville, Kentucky. It was WSVG Land War. This is the tournament where he actually beats Toxic and he wins the tournament. And this time, remember, Toxic's the god. Toxic winning everything. Everyone's seen Fox play against Toxic. They've seen Sturby play against Toxic. They've seen Cooler, who's kind of like at this kind of at this point in time, kind of slumming it, like not practicing that much. They've seen all these players go up against Toxic and they just can't win. And and everyone's like, okay, I guess you just can't beat this Toxic guy. And then along comes Avic and just fucking beats the guy. And there's this famous story where. He was, because he was, Avic was like friends with Kula and everyone, everyone from Eastern Europe used to look up to Kula as the, like the god dueler of that era because he had been previously like 2005 sort of era. So they, they were friends and Kula played kind of a mentor role because Kula at this point isn't practicing that much. He's kind of a bit burned out from gaming, but he wants to pick up some easy money, playing some tournaments. He's still good. He can still get top fours, top threes sometimes. So he kind of mentors Avic, who has the skills now and is in the moment, but Kula has maybe the, the knowledge and experience of how to win and how to mind game people, but he can't actually do it. So Kula kind of points out, like, there's this sort of route that, I've, that Toxic runs. And, and famously, the anecdote is that he, he's, he writes it on the back of a pizza box. Like, okay, he's going to go to this armor here. And then if you can trap him, if you can cut him off here, then you could, like, maybe pr like break up his kind of rope his routine of what he always does and the way that he likes to attack when, when he's in control. We're talking about Toxic here. And Avic does it and it works. Again, this is the sort of shit that in a movie you'd be like, that's bullshit, that wouldn't work. That's partly because if you're the underdog, if you're not as good as the guy as well, it shouldn't work these things. But he had the skills. He was able to just act upon his idea of what he should do and just do it. Not to, double, to second guess himself, to overthink it in the moment, get afraid. That's the thing about people who can act in a pure manner. They, they act so purely that even the emotional aspect of how they're feeling doesn't get into what they do in the, in the game. It's not that they feel afraid, so then they do some heroic move. Ideally, they can feel afraid, but then they still play their best game. It's like, it's a, it doesn't matter. That's almost just like like rain beating down on the windows, but inside they can still do whatever they're doing. Yeah, that might like lower your mood and you think, ah, oh, it's a bad day and you, that has a knock-on effect. Ah, oh, it's a bit depressing and I wish I loved someone. None of that stuff. That's all happening in the outside. Inside, they're just there in the game focused and they just react. They proactively take a course on the game. So he manages to beat him. He goes to ESWC. This was interesting where Toxic had gone to QuakeCon. But ESWC, okay, Cooler's there. These great players are there. Avic manages to win that tournament. He beats the legendary Cooler in an ESWC final. Two-time ESWC champion Cooler. Um, rest of the year, he had some top four. Stops. That's the thing about him. He was never super consistent. That's why he never became the God player. So he could beat them, though. That's the key thing about him. On his day, he could. 2008, we switched over to the Quake 3. We switched back to Quake 3 because Quake 4 died off. The SVG circuit had died off. So we went back to Quake 3 for a while. The problem here is Avak had a sick little run, but it was during the era when Cypher first became a god. This is when Cypher was just fucking unreal at Quake 3 and reached a level in Quake 3 that you could make an argument is higher than the level anyone has ever reached in any other game, even Cypher and Quake Live, when Cypher became the ultra god of Quake Live towards the last two, three years. Because even Cypher and Quake Live, Quake Live didn't suit him as well. It was more of a defensive style of game. It was only 10 minute duels, etc. In In Quake 3, Cypher was freed in this 15 minute style and it was very fast and it was the CPMA. Uh, mod was using at the time, which made like lightning guns super imbalanced. And so with his skills and had the freedom to play in this more loose style, he was just fucking dominating guys. Like he was unbeatable. But Avic comes along and he has this sick little run of his own in 2008. He had like ESWC Paris, where he came top three, came third. Game Goon, Cypher didn't go, but he finished, he wins that tournament. Cooler was there, Fox was there. Those good guys were all there. He wins that tournament, one that, that Cypher didn't go to. ESWC Athens, he finished third. That was the one I think that Rafa won, actually, where... Yep, that was the one that Rafa won. Uh, Dreamhack Winter, the end of that year. Okay, there's no Cypher there, but listen, the strengths. There's some good players there at that tournament. There's Fox. Manages to win that tournament. That's like the end of Quake 3. Now we come into Quake Quake Live, which was basically Quake 3, like a slightly different version, but in the free-to-play client, and it has some changes, like Rocket Launcher a little bit more powerful. 
new maps for the start of 27, 29. We had all these new maps added. Going into 2009 and Quake Live, despite being so high on in Quake 3, they're like top three for sure, top two or top three. I'd, I'd probably have said the second best player overall in Quake 3 at the end of it. Coming into Quake Live, initially, he actually does fucking terribly. Like at the first Quake Con he went to, the one that Rafa won, he, he finished like ninth to 12th or something. Utterly ridiculous. Like for a player of his level, that would just never happen. It never happened at other lands. And yet he just bombed it completely. But immediately he figures it out. He sort of gets his practice back. I remember there was some story where he'd said before DreamHack Winter at the end of that year in November, late November, he'd been saying like, a pra he'd been practicing online. He's fucking losing to everyone. Like he just couldn't pick up a win. Even versus Scrubs and guys he wouldn't even know. And then he comes to, to DreamHack Winter. He comes to this tournament where he plays cooler in i think it was in the let me think i think just the way the way the tournament worked it must have only been like the the quarterfinals he plays cooler he has a six series it's a really fun back and forth cooler's just got back in a quake live he's just going hard now and he manages to beat cooler he even beats him on ztm which is one of cooler's like maps where that guy was one of the masters of ztm he beats him he beats him playing cooler style style quake sort of beats cooler at being he out coolers cooler if you want to use that phrase and he wins despite the fact that coming into it, if you're one of these people who believe in concepts like momentum and mental confidence and all that things, which, listen, they have their place, but I think people use them, they, they use them too broadly and they crowbar that narrative over the things. Whereas actually, if you're just a great player and you figure out your moment, you how to act, that's what, that's actually, you. basically the great players kind of understand in the moment the language of the game and how the game almost, it's almost like the game calls to them and how, how the game wants to be played. And when they can just obey that and they can just have that pure connection between them and the game, that's when they can win. Regardless of the meta, regardless of all these other things, that's when they're at their absolute best. That's why it's genius when you see the greatest players. That's why you can't believe what's unfolding before your eyes because it's so amazing. It's like, this looks, wor this is worse than a movie in terms of the writing. As in like, how could he hit that shot? And then, oh, you had three seconds and he finds him here and he kills him and he goes to overtime. And then you just know in overtime he's going to win. He's going that's what happens when the greatest players were in the flow state when they were in their moment when they're just focused in the zone in that cliched sense but but just in a, a very that's the only way to describe it unfortunately so in quake live you get the sense already okay there was no Rafa at that tournament but he wins that tournament over cooler he's going to be dangerous again he's getting back to that level he's not the guy who bombed the quake con tournament so 2010 comes along and now we have this iem circuit now, the IEM European Championships, he has this semi-final against Cooler, where actually he was losing early on. He lost the 27. There was this problem with these timers, and I won't go into that whole incident. But anyway, Cooler gives him a restart. He actually wins it. He comes back, and he manages to win the the actual series 3-1. to one. It was a really exciting series. He goes to the final, but this is when Cypher has his first breakout Quake Live tournament where he really goes God mode. And Cypher just plays wonderful quake and the thing with the two of them is because they were both teammates when they played each other it always looked like they never really did have the same sort of calculating style of like i gotta beat that guy and like i'm gonna attack his weaknesses it felt like they just both went in and were kind of like listen i'll play my game uk law game who cares who wins we're on the same team anyway we've both got the first and second locked up let's just see how it goes let's play for the title who cares like it's like they didn't care that much so it was just a just a just a, a brawl fest when they play basically and he lost that one in narrow fashion to cypher Going into the IM World Championship as a result two months later, actually, you'd have to expect that, that Avec was one of the favourites for the title because, yes, we've had Rafa come along. Yes, Cypher's now won this tournament. But Avec's been right there all along and he meets Kula in the semi-finals. It's a rematch. And this time, Kula has this insane strategy that Kula has never done before where Kula isn't aggressive. Kula doesn't try to break control when he's out of control. He lets Avec be in control with like zero frags or one frag and he just plays super passive. And he, because Kula's so good at reading the game, he just uses that skill instead of to create an opening to attack Avec, just to always avoid him, to never be where Avec's coming, to pick up the odd armor and the odd weapon here, but to never be where Avec is. And what's amazing is Avec, as a result, is running control over and over and over. And you'd think to yourself like, this is great. This is ideal for him. But actually, this frustrates Havoc because his style when he's in control is to put the pace on you, to put a beating on you, like to use his stack and to smash you down and make sure that you're killed now and take a risk here just to bully you here and run the score up so that even if you got back into control, you can't do it the same way he has. You don't have the same power, the same kind of force within the game to be able to do that. And so that's how he blows you out the server and destroys you mentally and breaks you. And he couldn't do this versus Cooler. And he was and he was getting frustrated. And then those moments come where Cooler has these couple of amazing fights over the series that he wins. And Cooler manages to beat him and actually win the series and go to the final. Now listen, Avec beats Cypher in the third place game. He still proved he's an elite level player, but he's gotten beaten by some kind of interesting strategy here. And the first kind of doubt sets in. So going through the rest of that year, Dreamhack Summer, Cypher and Avec get to the final. 
could Avec manages to beat Cypher, close series. Kind of the same shit that was at the IEM4 European final. Same sort of, just play it out. And this time it's Avec that comes out. Oh, because he's won his first big tournament with like elite level players at the tournament there. In terms of like everyone in their prime and whatnot. No Rafa though. ESWC, he beats Cooler again in a semi-final. It's like, okay, maybe that wasn't such a big... It was only a best of three this time, but okay, maybe that wasn't such a big deal what happened before. Forget about that for now. He beats Cooler, gets past him, gets to the final, has to play Rafa. Now, unfortunately, a career theme would be that he could just never beat Rafa. Rafa's style, kind of like the Cooler style, that would frustrate him, but also Rafa would just pick these amazing moments to take the fights. And then when Avek was using his, like, immediately break-back control style... Rafa could punish that and he could evade it and so it would really frustrate Avec and you could feel that Avec he'd only be good for the first three or four minutes in a Rafa game and then once he'd lost that map he was mentally broken he could never do comebacks against Rafa felt like he was just pl flustered he didn't understand what was happening it didn't make sense to him listen this makes sense to me that Rafa was so unlike any other player in the way he thought about the game and approached it his un unwillingness to take fights that were risky that it it meant that you weren't prepared you, did, you couldn't practice against anyone like Rafa the other players would give you these chances and give you these opportunities they'd say hey it's just 60 40 fight around the 60 favorite yeah, fuck it i'll take it and then you might win some of those if you were an amazing player like avik who could turn that 40 percent actually into more than that even though the standard would be 40 percent you could do some insane mechanical outplay and win that fight or take some crazy angle or some super ballsy early engagement and you might win that actually so going forwards from that this is kind of where avik actually he never would get he never would get his chance to win the big tournament in fact he, he would barely even make finals from now on after this was when Rafa was in God mode still. He was winning all the alternates. Then towards the middle of the year, towards the end, Cypher had his real, real takeover of the throne. Beginning of the year, 2011, Cypher was the best player at this point in time. Semi-finals of the European Championships for IM Season 5. Avec beats him. Like, actually, fairly convincingly in the semi-finals. It's like, wow, he's just beaten the best player in the world. He goes to the finals playing cooler. This is the guy where he's beat with DreamHack Winter, beat me SWC. Yeah, he lost that final uh, semi-final at the IEM European Championship. Who cares about that? That was a one-off. That was a weird strategy. That won't work again. Except Cooler comes along and does the same strategy again to some insane degree. And the problem with it was, the strategy alone wasn't what it was. It was the execution of it. Like, you had to have this insane intuitive sense that Cooler did for how to dodge and evade being found by Avec and how to still get something from the map, like get a yellow armor, but without giving up position where you then had to be take a fight with a lesser stack. So he does this. Cooler actually wins 3-0 to zero in all these close maps. Cooler wins his first title. avex being kind of denied again. That was Avex's chance to start to, to, to at least become the best European again. Then he could make his claim at the next tournament. Next tournament, plays Cooler again, this time in the in the quarterfinals. It was technically not quarterfinals because there wasn't eight, eight, eight players there. But it's the quarters in as much as you just play that match before the semis. So he plays Cooler here. Cooler does the same shit again. Super low score. This is the most low scoring series I think I've ever seen. Cooler's winning like 1-0, one 1-0, to zero, one to zero, going to overtime. But he does it. It's somehow Cooler's just got Avex's number at this point in time. And that aggressive style, you can start to see that Avex now losing to a bunch of players. And now it's like, uh, he's kind of losing faith even within his own style. And he's kind of rethinking it. Like, do I have to rethink my style like obviously i have to now react to what they're doing because they've kind of got me solved a little bit from beyond that he still has some great tournament results he'd have all these dream hacks where he was getting third 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 to fourth fourth he has all these great results but now he always loses to cypher when cypher plays him he just gets beaten he always loses to rafa still he never figured rafa out it's always happening he even had the odd tournament where someone could upset him in a, in a match a lesser player so here's the thing about avec let's talk about his strengths and his skills you have to start when you talk about Avec. The first word that you should bring up is aggression. He was the most aggressive, successful Quake dueler in history. And there's no one even close. Like, when you think of aggression in that particular sense, you think of, in old school terms, you think of Cooler. Because the thing about Cooler was, Cooler didn't have the sickest skills. What Cooler's main strength was, what's funny is, Cooler's skills weren't as good in his his prime, 2005 to, 2003 to 2005, Quake 3 was Cooler's prime. His his strength wasn't like raw fighting skills. He did have a good LG, but his rail wasn't that good. His rockets were just okay. Well, that's the realistic. They were good. They just weren't the best, okay? The reason why Cooler could win, though, is because, okay, think about it. When you're fighting someone in a battle, yes, you have your aim to try and out-aim them and win, but a way you can make their aim worse is by dodging better. So Cooler's skill was dodging. Now, Cooler would use this dodging and use this... A bit, so, as a result, he could avoid taking damage. He would use that to even up fights where he had less stack and less chance and less weapons of winning the fight normally in a compute simulation than the enemy. So, what would happen is, if you broke Cooler's control and you killed him, 
he would find a really unorthodox, very rapid way to just get some sort of a weapon and surprise you just when you were in the process of still taking control. Like you have some more armor, some more weapons, but you, you haven't fully done your run and got every your stack totally maxed out. Kuno would surprise you then, do a crazy fight where he'd get super close range, he'd like outfight you, just do some ballsy play where he'd just be, what the fuck? And then he'd get control back. And what, what he'd do is he'd abuse the fact that over 15 minutes, he's going to get multiple chances to do this. And so he's going to snap back control constantly. Now that style... It's like Avec watched that. I don't know whether he actually did watch it in this sense, but in, in, in my hypothetical, it's like he watched that and thought, I can take that even further. I can make this the most extreme aggression you've ever seen. Like every time I'm out of control, I'm going to take every single 40-60 fight and I'm going to win a whole bunch of them just by pure force of like, I'm never going to back off from these. I'm going to go all in on them. I'm going to get one weapon. And I'm just going to batter you. Like one of the main, when you talk about skills, that's the thing. Avek didn't have the dodging of Kula, but he had the, he had a couple of things up on Kula. First of all, Avek has some of the best movement ever in Quake 3 and Quake Live. He can fucking book it around a map. That guy is really, really smooth, maximum speed. Strafe jumping around the map, really impressive. So he gets speed is very good, which is going to help him cut people off and force these situations and, and aggressively pursue people. Also, he had better skills than Cooler. Now listen, in the early days, 2003 to 2005, Cooler's skills weren't that great. In Quake Live, when he came back full on, he got his rockets very good. His rail became really good. His Cooler's skills got very good overall. Avec was still better. The best in terms of skills were probably Cypher, then Avec, then Cooler. Like... Avec's skills were unreal. First of all, his plasma was absolutely incredible. One of the best plasma players ever. Utterly unreal. And the plasma is often a weapon in terms of the maps that's available very quickly off a of spawn. As in, the other players don't lock that off in the same way they do a rail or go to the, the rockets over and over. So if he got a plasma and he closes the gap on you as you're going for a red armor, before you pick it up, that guy can bust you up there. He can fuck you up before you get on that red. And also, if you think about the way the plasma works, if you're amazing with it, you fire it onto that red. So if they want to pick that red up, they have to take a fuck ton of plasma balls in their face. And he's closing the distance on you while you do that. So this is a very hard style to deal with. Most people in control are used to a little bit of breathing room where the other guy has to recoup and re-strategize and figure out an opening. Avec creates the opening immediately. He doesn't wait for your opening to have finished. You start to take advantage of it and he just busts his way back in. So incredibly, incredibly dominant in that sense. In terms of raw skill and skill set on the weapons, he had no weakness. There was not a single weapon that he was weak at. Very good movement, like I say. The thing with him was, though, it was less planning. Like some of Cooler's break control back moments were like incredible intuitive reads on the game like understand like this all this opportunity is, appears now and there's a window i can very quickly see and just seizing it immediately avex was more like i'm going to take back control no matter what it's brute force with avex he's going to use those skills as a sledgehammer as a, as a battering ram to just destroy you to smash open the gates and just come in completely so it's less about planning and more about brute force and as a result one of the downsides of avex play and this will sound very weird to people who watched him play was when he was in control, he wasn't quite as dominant and such a close-out player as some of the other great players of, who, of the era when Cypher was on top and Rafa was on top, and even Cooler to a degree. Because when, when Avec is, on, is in control, in the same way as he only has that, like, fifth gear style of being out of control, that's all he had when he was in control. Like, when he's in control, his aim is to turn the heat up to the max and to just uh, find you constantly while, with his stack and then bully you down. Because remember, he can win fights with a lower stack. So when he has a stack, he's going to fucking put it on you all the time. He's going to put keep you under pressure the whole time so you're uncomfortable, you're running away, you're second-guessing yourself, you don't even know whether to go for that. He's hunting you down, he's bullying you, he's killing you, he's racking the score up and up and up and up and up so even if you're gonna break into back into control because of his risky play odds are you can't get it the score's out of control or he's gonna break it back right after and you have that worry it's it's the mental game as well he's bullying you mentally i often think of him that's when he was a bully in the game that was but in a good way as in he would just he wouldn't let you breathe he wouldn't give you that moment to recoup he wouldn't let you find the comfort zone he would constantly be pushing in on you and you would feel this claustrophobic aspect of him just coming in and in and in but as a result that's all he would do when he's in control like that so sometimes for example when he played cooler Cooler could snap control back a little bit. It'd be a game between them. Cooler, when he got this crazy kind of slower style, then was able to frustrate Avex as Avex doing what he wants to do there. Rafa could use the Avex aggression against him. I always think of Rafa almost in when he played Avex specifically only here as like a judo fighter. Like what well, Rafa's style was like your aggression and your weight and your momentum is what I'm going to use against you to defeat you now. Like, you're going to come in and force a 40-60 fight. 
but I'm now going to back out in a way where either I can make it into a 70-30 fight for me, or I can just get away entirely, and you've kind of played your hand there, and now you have to miss an item that I go and collect, or I just go and run them up. Rafa could kind of get the read on, on how to play Avak in that sense, and Cypher could just outshoot him. That was part of the problem in the latter days. Now, part of the strength of this style of Avek is this no-hesitation play. Whatever your soul tells you in this moment is what you're supposed to do. You just do. There was a direct connection between that force and just the game. It's like, there, it's like there was no analysis, there was no introspection, there was nothing in between. And that's what was so awesome about it. That's what meant that he could just defeat people like Toxic in his prime, Cooler, Rap, well not Rafa, Cypher in his prime. He could be, defeat all these players. Now, as a result though, he was very much a confidence player. It's when his confidence waned, when someone did get in his head like Rafa, when, or when Cooler frustrated him, when his emotions would literally start to impinge on his game and get into that world, when they'd break in through the window, and now he's starting to have the rain pouring in on his face and distracting him and the wind blowing. This is when now he could get, fr get rustled and get kind of like thrown off his game. And when he got thrown off his game, he got thrown off his game way worse than almost anyone else I can think of. So you, you have to talk now about why he won and why he lost in this respect. So he won because he was incredibly ballsy. He's one of the ballsiest players ever. Just unreal aggression and willing to take risks no one else was. Especially because very few people have the skill set to execute on a risk like he could. An unthinking, but in a positive way. Just pure, instinctual play. And he had incredible instincts in terms of aggressive, knowing when to take fights. Why did he lose, though? Well, first of all, raging... Whenever his emotions would get in, they could destroy him completely. He could destroy himself more than the enemy. It's very rarely that the enemy actually did mind game him and trash talk him or push him or bully him in the way he would others. It's like once he got turned on himself, he would destroy himself and bully himself down in the way he would others in that particular sense and have that mental pressure onto himself. And so he would rage quit games really early. I've seen rage quit games at four minutes when there still were chances to win the game. Definitely. He's rage quit them way early, psyched himself out of games where he just stops giving a fuck and he doesn't even play properly. And then he, as a result, it's not that he rage quits, but he almost like suicides over and over and over, but not in a fashion where he's actually, he's playing the same style as if he was going to get back control. But now he's like suiciding him with just a shotgun versus the guy who's got a full stack and is literally waiting around a corner with a rocket launcher. Like situations where you were never going to do it, but just out of frustration, almost like, oh, fuck this and I'll just go in now and oh, look, it's bullshit that he killed me. He could really get in his own head. Also, if you want to talk why he didn't win, matchups. So in his peak in Quake Live, let's say, he used to be able to beat Cypher and Cooler in the early days. He could beat both in a series. What was the problem? In the early days, you had to be able to beat... Well, first of all, he didn't beat Cypher at that one European Championship where he could have won it and there's another title. But more importantly, at the tournament that had Rafa, he couldn't beat Rafa. Rafa just had the style for him. Rafa had everything figured out. Listen, Rafa had everyone figured out at the time, but Avec, especially of the great players, Rafa had, had figured out. So he always lost to Rafa. Then, Cooler started to figure out the style to play against him, maybe partly influenced by the effect of Rafa coming in the game, bringing a more strategical meta game to it. Cooler started to figure it out, won these key series against him in these big moments. So now there's two of the three great players, the, 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 we had the big four in Quake Live, who were now beating him. So he's only got Cypher left. And remember, he could still beat Cypher a lot of the times. He beat him in DreamHack Summer 2010 final. He beat him in the IEM 5 European semi-final. He was able to beat Cypher, and then that stopped. Because remember, their style when they played each other wasn't that tactical, it wasn't that approach. It was just straight up brawl fest. And Avek could get the better of the skill battles. Um, amazingly, versus one of the best players ever, probably the most skilled player ever, he could still win those battles. But then Cypher essentially, it's not that Cypher figured it out, Cypher just became a god. Like Cypher became even better at that aspect. Then Cypher toned down some of his raw aggression and looseness, added in a little bit of strategy. He would do it more with others. It would still be a bit loose when they played each other. But just that little extra tweak... Now Cypher wasn't losing to him either. Now Cypher would beat him in every semi-final, every round of eight, whatever they would play, and he would win the tournaments. So now there was no one left out the great players from him to play. So that was Avek the player. I mean, listen, one of my favorite players. One of the, If you want to talk about exciting players to watch, he's going to be top five all-time duelers, without a doubt, if not top two or top three. He's up there with Cooler in terms of every game's exciting and the, his style of play. There's never going to be a dull moment because when he gets out of control, he's going to get, try and force his way back in. It's not going to be three minutes of him running away. He's on ZTN and trying to get an armor here and a shotgun here and pick up some shards. That's not Avex style. And when he's in control, he's going to put a fucking beating on this guy. He's going to actually dominate him. If you want to talk about dominance when in control, one of the most scary, one of the hardest of all time in terms of just battering people down. An awesome player to watch, and I loved watching his career.